gentlemen, that's just a sample of the tremendous work uh, that's going to be on display here tonight. So make sure you make your way back here at 6.30 tonight to see the rest of the show and see how the Lord's using our children for his glory. Let's stand, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give our own worship to the Lord at this time with an old familiar hymn that we know, Holy, Holy, Holy. Unmute the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> sing it one time all the way through. It's a very simple song, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. It's called His Name is Holy.
there was a point where we were living day to day. We didn't know. We even had, you know, a little bit of things packed in case things suddenly became worse and we had to get out of the country. Why Vietnam? Uh, why my determination? Even though it seemed like it was not open, not able to go there, uh, there were dark war clouds way off on the horizon. They said, you need to stay in the cities because the countryside is becoming increasingly troubled. Things were looking uh, pretty dark here. People began to come in from the mountains and they said, the VC are attacking huge forces. The Vietnamese army is fleeing and we have come to find refuge. And we knew that the big attack had occurred. So I stood on Coca-Cola crates out in a field and spoke almost all day long. They were so uh, afraid, didn't know what was going to happen. And so I felt like maybe the time had come when I needed to get out. I didn't get to go say goodbye. Uh, I didn't get to explain why I'm leaving. Uh, it just it just happened. I remember looking down and I uh, could see fires burning here and there. And, uh, and uh, thinking, you know, uh, Will I ever be back here again? And thinking about the Vietnamese, will they think that I deserted them in their hour of greatest need? What are they going to think of me for leaving? And I, I hope. Coming back to Vietnam for the first time. And it was 1989, things were still tightly controlled here. And we landed, and I remember seeing all these people on the roof of the, uh, of the airport terminal. We saw all these people calling to us, and we realized they'd come to meet us. We all sat down, and they began to say, now here's what we've done up in the, up in the northern part of, of Vietnam, and, and here's what we've done down here, and here's what we've done over here, and we've got this many believers, and we've had this happen. When we had to leave, the church was here. God kept it going. And now, all these years later, the church is just getting stronger. But it was that Southern Baptist cared enough to send someone here with the gospel. That we have what we have today in Vietnam. And people are being saved, coming into the church, and the church is being established. Which can then minister to the whole country. I don't think there's any question that God loves the people of Vietnam. And they are open if we can get the gospel to them. Amen. Well, let's stand. Let's continue to worship.
Before I pray, I uh, just got back from Haiti, and I was asked by the Haitians to uh, tell the people in America, merci beaucoup, which is, they speak French and Creole, and it, it means thank you very much for sending people to help rebuild Haiti. There are up to about eight or 900 permanent homes now. Their goal is 1,000, and it'll give them something to live in, whereas they were living in tents before. So, they said, thank you very much. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. You're such a great and awesome God. You bless us in so many ways. And we just come this time to bring a little back to of what you've given us so graciously. We ask you to bless it and use it to further your work here in America and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Open the eyes of the blind. 
God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Charlotte Diggs Moon. Everyone calls me Lottie, Lottie Moon. I was born December the 12th, 1840. I lived at Viewmont between Scottsville and Charlottesville. My mother was the spiritual leader in my family and she continually prayed for me because I resisted spiritual training. When I was 14, I attended a school for girls and studied language and philosophy. At age 16, I graduated with honors. At 17, I entered the Albemarle Female Institute at Charlottesville. My friends prayed for me. They wanted me to be one to Christ. I attended a revival meeting. I intended to go there and make fun. But after the message, I went back to my room and I prayed. I prayed all night. I confessed my sins and I gave my heart to Jesus. From that moment on, my life was changed. When I was 20 years old, I graduated from the University of Virginia with a master's degree in languages, Greek, Latin, and French. At my sister Edmonia's urgence, I applied to be a missionary in China. In 1873, I traveled across the country to San Francisco and set sail in September, arrived in China in mid-December. When I arrived in China, the people called me and my sister devil women. They laughed at our strange dress and our big feet. They said, go away. You are not welcome here. We know what the white devils do to us. Will you lie and cheat us too? We went about quietly, making our home attractive, studying the difficult language, and enduring our desire to make friends. I wanted to teach the children. Their parents had warned them of the missionaries. I baked cookies, but they were afraid to eat them. But one day, a brave little boy took a cookie, ate it all. Nothing bad happened to him. The children came often to my home, little crossroads. They ate cookies and they listened to Bible stories. Slowly, the people warmed up to me. Admonia got sick and had to return to the States. I asked the Foreign Mission Board for a missionary couple to come and help me. They sent a message back. They were broke. They could not send the couple. In 1887, I planned a furlough to Virginia. On the Sunday before I left, two Chinese men came to my door. They called me Mu Ladi, Big Love Heart. That village had sent them for me to come there and tell the people the good news. I canceled my sailing plans and went to that village. The Southern Baptist women became aware of my sacrifice and my desire to, to win the Chinese people. In the summer of 1888, the women made plans for a week of prayer and an offering for missions in the Christmas week the Southern women came alive with missionary zeal. They gathered enough money for the two missionaries and even more. 
During my latter years in China, there was a famine, followed by plagues of smallpox and other diseases. I gave my salary and bank savings to the relief workers in North China. As you all know, I'm really not Lottie. At the age of 72, Lottie became ill with a strange, strange illness. The doctor told her co-workers that she was dying of starvation. He suggested that she return to Virginia. On Christmas Eve in 1912, Lottie went to be with the Lord. She was, her ship was docked at Kobe, Japan. She is buried at Crewe, Virginia. Lottie gave her heart and shared the gospel with her hands and her voice for almost 40 years in China. I thank you for your prayers for the missionaries in foreign countries and for your offerings. And I pray that God will give you a special blessing this Christmas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shirley, Lottie. Uh, that, was, that was good. I hope that was informational for some of us that maybe not didn't grow up hearing all about Lottie Moon and her story. What on earth would cause a human being to sacrifice so much of her life to literally starve to death to get people the good news? What would, what would motivate a person to live that way? Well, her hero lived that way. We read about him in Isaiah 53. Turn over to Isaiah 53. I want you to see this today. And Jesus Christ on Christmas, sometimes we just want to celebrate, you know, the lights and the, the baby in the manger and, and, and the, the sentimental stuff. But let, let's be reminded, Jesus came to die. He was born to die. He came and died so that we could live. And no prophecy, none that I can think of anyway, no prophet talks more about it and gives us more information than Isaiah. In Isaiah 7, you'll remember he said, a, a virgin will conceive and you'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Remember that? In, in chapter 9 of Isaiah, he says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Interesting prophecy there. How in the world did the Jews miss him? Well, they were expecting a revolutionary, a rebel, to put the government on his shoulders. They saw that prophecy but they missed a lot of the other ones, didn't they? They said his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the Lord Jesus Christ is all of those things, isn't he? I hope he's all of those things to you this morning. I hope that he's given peace into your life. I hope that he's your counselor. He is Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And then when we get to Isaiah 53, we, you know, they liberals have tried to explain away Isaiah 53. Those who do not believe the Word of God have done everything they could because it is so stunning to read these verses. We're going to read all of them. In fact, we're going to go back into 52 a little bit, and we're going to see how Jesus Christ is the servant. Isaiah in his prophecies talked about the servant, and, and the Jewish people had a, an understanding of this Messiah, this anointed one that would come. And <clears throat> this text tells us why he came. You know, at Christmas... Boy, it's wonderful to sing the songs and, and to be with family and to, to, to exchange the gifts and all that kind of stuff. But at Christmas, shouldn't we stop to remember why he came? He came with a purpose. And this prophet, 700 years before the time of Christ, told us all about it. It's amazing. It's astounding to think about. Isaiah, now, now they'll, say, they'll say, well, he must not have written that far before Christ because he, he, he um, prophesied... Uh, King Cyrus and other things that how could he have possibly known it? Well, they say he must not have written before then or there were multiple Isaiah's and then redactors came and and fixed it up to make it look like this guy really could tell the future and so forth. It's so stunningly accurate. The only excuse they can come up with for those who do not believe in inerrancy or those who do not believe in miracles or the, the power of God to, 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 to give a prophet the, to tell in the future, they cast stones at it because of the words we're about to read. Jesus Christ came, he was born on, on Christmas morning, and, that, that, and, and of course he died 33 years later, but that was part of a redemptive plan, God's redemptive plan for humanity that's still alive and well and active today. In fact, go all the way back to creation when, when um, 
Adam and Eve sinned. What did they do? They, God covered them up with animal clothes. Well, where do you think he found those animal clothes? There weren't animal clothes laying around to do that. Animals had to die. Their blood was shed. And Adam and Eve were covered up with their garments. Then just fast forward up until the time of the Exodus when the children of Israel uh, got out of Egypt in, in the Passover land. You remember the story of the, 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 the death angel came and struck the firstborn, but whoever had the lamb's blood on their doorpost were saved. Remember that lamb? And, and you can study a lot about that, that Passover lamb, which is, of course, in the New Testament, we have the, the Lord's Supper. But that lamb, no bones were to be broken. Very important, no bones were to be break, broken in that preparation. And the blood, from the, they were shed on the door. And of course, fast forward up to the time of Christ 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, his bones were out of joint. He was, he was brutalized on the cross, but none of his bones were broken. So we can kind of go back and forth. And I think some of us that have been in church for a long time or maybe have, uh, familiar with it, sometimes we take it for granted. But there are times in the Bible, in Isaiah's prophecy, where he was prophesying about things that would happen a few hundred years later, 700 years later, and things that are, have not yet happened today, 2,700 years later. So it's, it's worth reading, it's worth understanding, and let's just read through the chapter, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to kind of analyze the chapter. But go back to chapter 52. Let's talk about the servant. You see there in verse 13 of 52? See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form did not resemble a human being. So he sprinkled many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, for they will see that what had not been told them, and they will understand what they had not heard. Who has believed the report? Who has we believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or splendor that we should look at him or appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like one people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Where did Lottie Moon get the idea to sacrifice her life for the kingdom, to spend years and years in a, in a land of you know, barbaric people who thought she was the white devil? Her hero lived that way. Her savior lived and died. The servant goes on to say in verse 4, yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains and we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. Struck down by God. We'll come back to that later. Isn't it interesting to see? You know, who killed Jesus? Remember the hubbub over the, the Passion movie? And they said, how could they possibly insinuate that the Jews killed Jesus? You know, the, 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 they got mad about the people protested over that. And others say, well, it was the Romans who killed Jesus because the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. But when you look at that, he was struck down by God and afflicted. He was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. The punishment of our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. By his stripes we are healed has been so misunderstood, and so misapplied. Do not let those who are, who are lost in, 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 or deceived into uh, what... what um, one, one scholar calls the charismatic confusion from Isaiah 6. This is not a promise that you will be healthy, wealthy, and drive a Porsche. Okay? This is clearly not. Anybody that would take that and say, man, you should never get sick. You could never, if you're sick, you don't have faith and, and, and all that kind of business. It's, it's so misinterpreting Isaiah 50, uh, 53, 6. It's, 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 it's a shame what some people do with the Word of God. We are, we are saved because of his wounds. We are set free, and we are healed, and God does heal people. Our God could heal you of whatever sickness you have, and you know what? God could have healed your loved one of whatever sickness they died from. And when Jesus healed people on earth, guess what? There was millions of people, millions and millions of people he did not heal physically. By his wounds, by his stripes, we're healed. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned away our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of the oppression of judgment, and who, and, and who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. They made his grave with the wicked and with rich men at his death. Although he had done no violence, and, and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him, and he made him sick. 
Have you ever read that verse and thought, what on earth is that saying? God was pleased to crush Jesus, made him sick, and when, you, and when you make him a restitution offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will succeed by his hand. He will see it out of his anguish, and he will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mightiest spoil because he submitted himself to death and he was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. At Christmas, on this, in this beautiful time of year that's just the lights, the colors, the, the props on stage, make sure you come back tonight and see the rest of what was going on with those children and the singing, it's going to be great. Next Sunday, the adults will be doing their musical. Listen, these are not performances to entertain you. These are ministry opportunities that you have to bring your friends and neighbors to Jesus. All of you that are in the program, man, get on your phone and call all your friends, neighbors, loved ones, and tell them they need to come and be here tonight and next Sunday. We want to lead people to Jesus. We want to connect people to Christ at Christmas. That's why we do these musicals. That's why we do these, these presentations is because it's an excuse it gives you a good excuse to invite your friends to church to hear the story of Jesus, who is what Christmas is all about. Not Santa, not reindeer, not lights, not giving away presents, not singing songs, not uh, uh, reindeer and, and, and elves and everything else that has flooded in this time of year. It's about a baby born in Bethlehem who lived to die because all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And we know that happened on the cross 2,000 years ago. Um, interesting in this passage, everything is talking as if it already happened. That's one of the confusing things about reading prophecy sometimes. It's, it's, all these things are being said as if they've already happened. Speaking past tense about things that were 700 years in the future, some things haven't even happened yet. Sometimes it's hard to follow. Of course, when we think about the mind of God, he's not bound to our way of thinking or our sense of time, is he? And, and, and there's two things that happen in this passage. I kind of want to, this passage tells us about two events. Number one, the, 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 it tells us that the servant would be sacrificed. And then secondly, it tells us that the servant would be exalted. That's really the whole point of this passage. The servant would be sacrificed and the servant would be exalted. Of course, I say that in future tense. It says it in past tense. And, and, and I've been thinking about that a lot, a, a lot. Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords, yet he's not stepped down onto the Mount of Olives and asserted himself as king yet or started his millennial kingdom yet. We know that's future. doesn't make him any less king, but on that day he will be acknowledged by everyone as king. Of course, at Christmas, that's a great time to ask yourself, have you acknowledged him as king? King of kings, lord of lords. And, and, and many of the religious people, even people today, had a really hard time looking at this meek, gentle, quiet man who lived life. Very few people debate whether or not Jesus Christ existed, that there wasn't a person named Jesus of Nazareth. But the thought of him living, never sinning, dying on a cross, shedding his blood, why in the world did his blood matter any more than anybody else's blood? Could you have died on a cross for your sins? Could someone else have died on a cross and covered the sins of the world? Well, this text tells us why not and why only Christ's blood was sufficient. Go back to verse 14, and we see that he was beaten beyond recognition. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not even look like a man. Now, that, was, that, that prophecy was fulfilled, and I want to show you how different prophecies were fulfilled today in John 19. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, he was, he, he was, they beat his face. They slapped his face. They didn't even recognize him when he rose from the grave later. He was so beaten up, beaten beyond recognition. Down in chapter 53, verse 2, he was an ordinary person. He was an ordinary looking person. And contrary to every um, uh, Renaissance painting of Jesus with hair down to his hips, I don't necessarily think he looked like that. Just, that's personal opinion there. But he grew up before him like a young plant and, and a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or splendor that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was an ordinary looking Jew, first century. That's what Jesus looked like. I think of um, people I've run into. I think of like Robert Duvall, who I've never run into. But he, you know, he's probably the most uh, accomplished actor of our generation or one of the most, you know, he lives up in Northern Virginia somewhere on a farm. You know, people go to the market and run into Robert all the time. Hey, Bob, how you doing? You know, 
He just looks like an average guy. He looks like my dad, really. That's one reason I kind of, I, li I like Robert Duvall. It reminds me of my dad a lot from his generation, too. When, when I lived in Blairsville, Georgia, we went to um, Pappy's Riverside Grill. Pappy's Riverside. And it's everything you could think of a place that would be called Pappy's Riverside. And it's right by a river. And, and they sell stuff, country stuff, and you eat. And, and right over across the, 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 um, the little cafeteria from me was Bill Elliott. This is 15 years ago when Bill Elliott was still kind of the man. You know, he had a, um, a cast on his leg because he'd had a, a racing accident. I was like, that's awesome, Bill from Dawsonville, right there, you know. And, and my buddy who I was with said, hey, why, why don't you go shake his hand, talk to him. I said, I don't want to bug Bill while he's eating, but I'm looking over at Bill, and the, and the, the thought occurred to me, he's just an average-looking person. Of course, he drives a race car really fast. I think he drove one faster than anybody else. Jesus Christ was just an average-looking person, and they totally missed him because man looks on the outward, right? We, we see people and just say, well, it's an average... No, there was something, of course, very special about him. And this passage goes on to talk about that. He was forsaken, in verse 3, forsaken by all. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of suffering, who knew his sickness was. He was despised, and we did not value him. Boy, that's, that's something to underline right there in verse 3. We did not value him. I can understand that lost people wouldn't value Jesus, although he's their lifeline, he's their only hope for heaven. It's sad that they don't value Jesus. Isn't it true, though, that even Christ followers, Christians, supposedly disciples, oftentimes don't value him? Of course, we know that was fulfilled in John 1. Uh, he came into his own, and his own did not receive him. They rejected him. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. The punishment of our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. He was wounded, he was bruised, he was literally pierced through. Now, here's something cool to think about, prophecy-wise. A couple hundred years before Isaiah wrote this, the psalmist wrote Psalm 22. Write that down and read it later. You would think you were reading the story of the crucifixion. Of course, you are. So hundreds of years before Isaiah's prophecy, God spoke through the psalmist and prophesied what would happen here. We've all went astray like sheep in verse 6. Now, this kind of gets personal because I think most people would be willing to say, yeah, I'm a sinner, but very few people would say, I'm a dumb sinner. You know, I'm kind of dumb like a sheep. We've all went astray like a sheep. Do you remember that television commercial a few years with the guy who was herding cat, cats? And he had a cat over a saddle, and he said, and it really feels good when you bring in a herd of cat. Do you remember that? Sure, I, I, you know, that cracked me up. I remember that commercial. I, was, I don't even know what they were selling, but it, it, it was funny. Well, herding sheep, herding cat, herding people is much the same way. We, we're rebellious. It says we've all turned our own way. The Lord had to put the punishment of him, our punishment, went on him. Our iniquity was laid on him. He bore the sin of humanity. And I love that story about the king. You may have heard it. The, the king who had a kingdom, he had his palace, and someone was stealing money out of the treasury, and it made him really mad. And he, and he, and he said, you know, $50,000 reward for whoever finds the joker that's stealing money out of my treasury. And, and they never found him, and, 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 and money kept disappearing. And he said, look, and when a king makes a decree, it's final. The person who is stealing money, you're going to die. We're going to execute you. Don't do it anymore. And sure enough, money came up missing. But this time they had a trap. The trap was set. They caught the person that was stealing the money. And it turned out to be the king's son. And his son had to be whipped. His son had to be executed. And his son was put a, a, up to the pole and tied to the pole. And his beating, before they could give the son his beating... The king stepped behind his son and he wrapped his arms around his son and he held on to his son and he took the beating for his son because he loved his son. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. That's what God did. He sacrificed his son for us. He took our beating. He took the punishment for our sin. He died for humanity. He was oppressed in verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Now that was fulfilled in Matthew 26, 23. Jesus kept silent when he was being put through Pilate and all, all, the, all the trial and, and everything he went through. He kept silent. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He died for humanity. Now, now, the symbolism and the metaphors are going wild and crazy here because we're sheep, right? But now the good shepherd, the servant, is going to be like one of his sheep who being sheared is one thing, but the sheep would die. The sheep had to die. He became one of us. He had to become one of us. And he died for us. 
The good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd became a sheep. He became one of us. Now, I think, I, I'm still thinking a lot of us take this stuff for granted. Well, that's nice. Don't really think about it. Listen, there's people who don't believe any of this stuff. Imagine if Isaiah was written one week before, the, before Jesus was born and all these prophecies were written. It was, and it was written hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ was born. It's stunning. All of us have friends that do not know the Lord. Some of them are open to the things of God. Some of them are not. Some of them are um, too smart for God. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they won't even listen. Nobody, no educated person believes the prophecies of Isaiah were written a week before the time of Christ. Nobody questions that they were written well before the time of Christ. And then Jesus Christ came, and he fulfilled them. He did not open his mouth. In verse 8, he was taken away because of the oppression of judgment, and who considered his fate? He was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was executed for crimes he did not commit. He was struck. Your translation might say he was cut off. Write down Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, 26, 7, 8. Daniel prophesied. Do you remember the 70 weeks of Daniel? 69 of those weeks came to fruition. 69 sevens. Okay, we went back to Psalms and David, then we went to Isaiah. Fast forward a couple hundred years to Daniel. And in his prophecy, he said, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. They missed that. They missed Isaiah 53. They had a, a concept of a king, a ruler, a revolutionary, but they missed Daniel's prophecy that he, he would be cut off. Now, what's interesting about Daniel, that's written in the 5th century B.C. He said in seven 69s, in 69 weeks of years, which if you add that up is 483 years, Messiah will become and be cut off, but not for himself. These are astounding prophecies, folks, that at Christmas it does well. That, that's the Christmas story. Daniel predicted it in Daniel chapter 9, that he would come and be cut off. And Isaiah says he'll be cut off, that he'll be struck down but because of my people's rebellion. He appeased the wrath of God towards sin in verse 10. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him. Now, that may not make sense to you. That may not make sense to any of us. How is a father pleased by crushing his son? I mean, that's a, that is a very difficult thing to understand. Turn over to 1 John. I want you to see this one. Turn, turn over to 1 John chapter 2. There's a word in the Bible that even the more modern translation still at, usually translates propitiation. And that's not one you're probably going to use at work tomorrow, but, but it is a fantastic word to help us understand. It's a, it's a theological word that helps us understand what happened to Jesus, why it had to happen to Jesus. Why was the Father pleased? Why was he appeased or satisfied with what happened to Christ on the cross? Look at 1 John chapter 2, chapter two verse 1. My, my children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I mean, that, that, the Bible's so clear sometimes. Stop sinning. It'll do, you know, it's like drink milk. It'll do you a whole lot of good. Well, stop sinning. It'll do you a whole lot of good. But, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now look at verse 2. He himself, Jesus, is a propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Look over to chapter 4, if you're already there in 1 John. In verse 9, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his Son, one and only Son, into the world so that we might live through him, Love consists in this. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word means that God's wrath, God's holy wrath, his anger towards sin was satisfied. That's what propitiation means. God was satisfied. God's hatred and his wrath towards sin was satisfied when it was laid on Jesus. Now, if you're there in 1 John, if you're already there, why don't you flip over to 1 Peter real quick? Just a couple pages over. We've gone 200 years before Isaiah. We've gone 200 years after Isaiah, 700 years after Isaiah. Now let's go into the first century A.D. Now Peter was there. He saw Jesus executed. And now either this is a book of fairy tales and, and quacks that somehow, they, uh, uh, somehow convinced everybody to believe, or these people, these apostles, laid their lives down for the Christmas story. That's why it's pretty careful that we protect Christmas and make sure that it doesn't get wiped off the map and politically uh, correctized away. These men died because a virgin had a baby who grew up to die for the sins 
of the world. And Peter was one of, one of them. Fox's Book of Martyrs tells us that Peter lived to be an old man, but he died and he was hung on a cross upside down. Now, either, either he was out of his mind or he believed firmly some things in the New Testament, in, in the A.D., 50, 60 A.D., there in 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 22. He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. This is an eyewitness of a man who rubbed shoulders with Jesus, knew him personally, betrayed him, or, um, or, or denied him, you could say, and then was, was reconciled with Jesus. When reviled, he did not revile in return. Now, that's prophecy. That's two, you know, 700 years later, Jesus did exactly what the servant of Isaiah's prophecy would do. When suffering, he did not threaten but committed himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounding, you have been healed. Now, where do you think Peter came up with that? Isaiah 53. For you are like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. If you have, praise God. If you have not yet returned to the shepherd in the garden of your souls, I would say today, give your heart to Jesus. Be born again. Give your heart to Christ. He was the servant who was sacrificed for your sins. Now let's get back to Isaiah 53. The Lord was pleased to crush him. He appeased God's wrath towards sin. Hopefully we all understand that a little better now. And then, not only was he the, 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 the servant who was sacrificed, of course, we know why that happened, but here's the really good news for today. He was the servant who would be exalted. Look at verse 11. He will see it out of his anguish. Now, that's clearly Jesus. And he will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many. That will satisfy him and he will carry their iniquities. That certainly didn't please him to have all the sin of the world laid on his holy body, to have to suffer through all that. But what we see is that Jesus Christ was sacrificed, but it didn't stay there. He was exalted. He was satisfied. He did the right thing. He did the smart thing. He did the prudent thing. He did the wise thing, because now he has millions, or I guess possibly billions of people who, who are indebted to him, those who he's forgiven, those who know him, those who are redeemed, who love him, who will worship him, who can make the choice. We are not robots. We are not programmed one way or the other. We, each and every one of us, make a choice to give our heart to Jesus. And after you give your heart to Jesus, you make a choice every morning when you wake up to, 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 before you get your feet on the ground to say, Lord Jesus, I love you, I worship you, I praise you no matter what. You are king of kings. I exalt you. Good or bad, healthness or sickness, till death do us part. Of course, we won't. Till death we meet, I will serve you. I will exalt you. So it satisfied Jesus because now he has millions, billions of worshipers. Therefore, and look in verse 12, he's rewarded here. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion. He's rewarded. He will receive the mighty as spoil because he submitted himself unto death and was counted among rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Now, in closing, Let's go back to the very first verse we looked at today. Verse 13 of chapter 12. See, my servant will act wisely. Jesus, he will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Isn't that amazing prophecy, thinking about what happened to Christ? He was raised and lifted up on a cross. The New Testament says the same thing. When Christ is lifted up, all men will be drawn to him. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted exalted, worship. For sake of time, just write down Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. It tells us that's exactly what happened. Jesus Christ was obedient to the death, the death of the cross, and now he's exalted. If you can find it, it might take a second. Turn over to Zechariah chapter 14. I want to I close on a really good note, on a high note. If you're looking for it, just go to the New Testament and then go left. A couple, a couple books. For some reason, the Lord saw fit to give us prophecy and to show us exactly how things would go. He gave the, his people prophecy hundreds of years before the time of Christ. We have prophecy about his return, uh, about a rapture that could happen any moment. At any moment, he could come back and take his church to himself in, the, in, a, in a blink of an eye, and we'll meet him in the air. 
The passage we're reading right now, or going to read, is not that. This passage talks about Christ in the armies of heaven returning with him and touching foot on the earth. We know this is a separate event prophesied in Zechariah. And the reason I'm reading this is I want to ask you, are you exalting him? His sacrifice was for you. And here's, here's the, the irony of the whole thing. Jesus Christ was born to die. He lived and died so that we could live, right? So we were born dead in sin. We're born dead. Dead men have no rights. Dead men don't have a whole lot going on. They're dead. Spiritually, that was us. Physically alive, but spiritually dead. He lived and died so that we could live because we are born dead. That's why he had to die. We're born dead. He gives us life. Now, here's, here's the catch, folks. Here's where Christians miss it, much less the world misses it. We don't really begin to live until we die to ourselves. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. My car is not my car, even though I got Redskins plates on it and really like it. My home is not my home. It really isn't my home. I can tell you. I can show you the math on that. <laughs> this church is certainly not my church. It's not yours either. You don't own it. None of us do. It's Christ's church. He's in charge of it. He's the boss. Every relationship in my life that I want to take control of and have it just the way I want it and, and take it and squeeze it and make it and... All I do is foul it up when I realize I'm dead to me. I'm dead to me. I've got to realize that every single day. And boys growing up, I think there's a lot of boys that are afraid to get married because they're like, oh my goodness, then kids happen and I lose everything and ugh, I don't have any money. It's true. It basically, that's kind of true. But what we need to tell them, what we need to explain to them, boys, is you haven't even begun to live. You're incomplete without a, a woman. And when you become one flesh, and then, yes, yeah, sooner or later, kids start popping out and and. That, yeah, you don't have any money, and the Corvette just went out the window and all that, but they make life worth living. And i got to be honest with you, I very rarely ever, if ever, even thought about that when I was a teenager. That, that uh, you know, the getting married part, yeah, but, but kids and family and responsibility and ball and chain and all that, 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 didn't appeal, that didn't appeal to me. Because I wanted to live to me, and I wanted to get all the stuff I could get, and I wanted to be happy, and I wanted to have my life and my control and my, my, me, me, me. What we learned from Jesus and what we learned from Lottie Moon a minute ago is that the best life, the most rewarding life, is the life where we take the example of what our hero, our Savior, our Lord, our King, what did He do? He gave up everything. He died and He suffered. He gave up heaven. He gave up all, all of those, those, those um, he, you know, he could have called 10,000 angels when they were sticking those nails in His feet and in His hands. He didn't. He didn't. He gave it up willingly. And that's how you should be living at Christmas. That's how this whole message relates to Christmas. Stop taking, start giving. Stop worrying about what you're going to get under the tree and start worrying about what you can put under someone else's tree. In fact, forget the tree. Let's, let's do less for our kids and more for kids that don't have anything. Let's do less for us and more for people who are in, lost, extremely lost. He is our king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He will be worshipped as king forever and ever. And in Zechariah, gave you a lot of time to get there, Chapter 14, just look at three different verses. And this is from a sermon I'm going to preach in the future, but I just had to share this today. Zechariah 14, verse 4. In fact, I had some verses from Acts I wanted to share with you today. We will be coming back to Acts. We have not forgotten about Acts. We're coming back in the new year, okay? But in Zechariah 14, verse 4, it says, On that day, and boy, read Zechariah and find out all about that day, the day of the Lord. On that day, his feet, and I believe his feet are the same feet of the servant, the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley so that half of the mountain will move to the north and to the south. And if you want to read more about it, read into Revelation. All the events that lead up to the return of Christ, coming with the armies of heaven to put an end to sin. If you're sick of sin, if you're sick of death, if you're sick of sickness and injustice and everything else, understand, so is Christ. He'll return and he'll make all those things right. And he will land his feet on the Mount of Olives. And I take this literally. And it'll be split in two. Look down at verse 9. On that day, Yahweh will become king over all the earth. Yahweh alone and his name alone. So all the armies of the earth will be coming against little Jerusalem. And, and Jesus Christ is going to intervene. Look down at verse 16. Then all the survivors from the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year 
to worship the king. That's getting into the millennial kingdom. He is king of kings. Those, those, those prophecies and those promises have, have future fulfillment waiting to come. Some of what Isaiah said is still future. But he promised that he would come. He promised that the, the virgin would conceive, that he would be mighty God, everlasting father, and he did. So we can take his promises seriously. And all the stuff that we get distracted with, all the, especially at Christmas, I'm, I'm, I understand I'm distracted too and there's a lot going on. I just want to encourage you today to remember that that little baby in Bethlehem who is still getting kicked out at the malls and the government places and, and people don't want to see that nativity scene anymore. We should all buy a nativity scene and put it in our front yard. That's what we're buying next is a nativity scene, big old nativity scene. Put it in your front yard. That baby... That baby was born to die so that we could live. And you were born dead until you gave your heart to Christ. And you're never going to really live until you die to yourself. And me too. And that's how we exalt him. It's not just Sunday mornings when we're singing songs, although they were beautiful today, Chris. Beautiful. Thank you for leading us in worship today. Thank you, choir. Awesome songs. But it's, it's, it's when you go home today. It's when you wake up tomorrow morning. It's at work when things don't go your way. And we all know they don't always go our way. And we exalt him by dying to ourselves, our plans, our desires, our feelings, everything we want for ourselves that we think will probably make us happy and say, no, thy will be done. I exalt you in every area of my life. That's how I want to live my life. I hope that you've given your heart to Christ. I hope that you've in, in, embraced him as king. If not, I want to encourage you to do it right now. He will come into your life. He will save you. He will free you. He will forgive you. That's the whole point of Isaiah 53. His blood was shed to wash away your sins. As you write your Christmas cards, and as you go home this afternoon, and as you think about the next few weeks, I want to encourage you to take the true meaning of Christmas to your friends at work, to your neighbors, to, to people you don't even know. I encourage you to exalt him this year at Christmas. Let's exalt him. Let's make that the number one priority of our Christmas at Kingsland. Would you pray with me? And we're going to have a little invitation, and you are invited to make a decision First of all, if you want to give your heart to Jesus, believing that this prophecy was true and that it was about the servant, the suffering servant who was born to die. And that, that he died for you. He died for me. He shed his blood for us, for our sins. If you want to give your heart to Jesus, I encourage you to do that right now. If you want to talk to somebody, you're invited to come forward and someone will talk with you. If you've already given your heart to Jesus, if you've been born again, but you've not requested baptism, come forward and request baptism. We will baptize you. Baptism does not save you. Baptism is something you do because the Holy Spirit has come into your life and baptized you inwardly. You make a public show of it by being baptized. That's your public proclamation of being saved. So let's start there. If you need to be saved, why don't you just invite Jesus Christ into your life right now? If, you, if, you've, if you've looked at Isaiah 53 and realized, man, that was for me. 700 years before the time of Christ, but that was for me. And you believe that Jesus Christ fulfilled all those prophecies and you'd like to invite Christ into your life right now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I encourage you to pray. And, and I'll give you words, but the words are, are, are not, it's not some magic formula. Something like, oh God, I need you right now. I humble myself before you right now. Please forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me, please. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior at Christmas. Man, there's no better time of year to make that decision than right now at Christmas. Lord, I give you my heart. If you've invited Christ into your life, I want you to come and tell me. You need to request baptism. Today, maybe it's become clear to you that, that your hero was born to die so that you could live, but that you're really struggling with wanting to take control of everything in your life. And, you know in your heart that it's time to, for you to die to your desires, your plans, and to give them to him, knowing that he will take them and give you real life. So you're not really living until you've been born again, and you're not really living until you die to your plans and live in his will for your life. If you have a burden on your heart and you want to pray today at the altar, if you want someone to pray with you, if you want to join our church, for something going in your, your life that you want someone to pray with or you want to pray by yourself, I encourage you to take advantage of this time, of this invitation. You're invited to respond, to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, knowing that he'll lift you up. He'll provide for you. He'll save you. He'll take care of you. He'll guide you. He'll do so much more for you. And his goal, his, what he wants from us is for us to simply love him and exalt him. 
I hope that you'll do that as we sing. Lord God, I pray that your vision for our lives would be what we desire. Your plan for our lives would be what we want. Lord, I pray that you'd convict us for the sin in our lives and that we would lay it down right now. For the distractions in our lives.